we have a funny and I am an island and I'm one of the EC members. And it's my great pleasure to introduce and say that this is so uh, regarding our keynotes. And as you probably know, we have different kind of keynotes within early. And one of these is a very special one, and this is the this one. So basically, like it's based always on the best application award of the previous early conference. Why the other ones actually emerge from the sick? So, uh, so the six laid by the pilot like uh, uh, ideas that what could be the next kilo. But this one is so special because we can really see that it's based on the scientific quality only. So it's my great pleasure to introduce the glory words. Salit Prasani and Eva Tall. And the keynote is about dealing with the disagreement. Come to the terms with the social nature of rights. And Said Prasai uh, is a doctor and senior lecturer in the Department of Learning and Instructional Sciences in the Faculty of Education at the University of Haifa, Israel. Her research focuses on the epistemic thinking, metacognition, multiple literacy, inquiry learning, and game-based learning. Her principal interest is in investigating how to promote learners' epistemic growth so that they are better able to cope with the challenges of the 21st century knowledge societies. Dr. Pastelli has extensively studied how epistemic thinking comes to the play as learners evaluate and integrate multiple information sources at present diverse perspectives. She also designs and investigates technology-enhanced learning in migrants, before promoting learners' epistemic growth in this context. Her most recent research focuses on how to address the current post-truth climate. Dr. Prasel has received the International Society of Learning Sciences Early Career Award, the International Journal of Learning Sciences Best Art Paper Award, and the Early Outstanding Publication Award, for which we are here for now. Her research has been funded by the several high established funding instruments, such as Israel Science Foundation, the U.S. Israel, by National Science Foundation and the Israel Ministry of Education. And the presentation is now together with her colleague Eva Thorn. Dr. Eva Thorn is a postdoctoral researcher and chair of the empirical education research and research methods at the University of Erhard, Germany. Her research focuses on the scientific research, art orientation, sourcing, and science communication. Particularly, she is interested in investigating <laughs> how to support non-experts in understanding and engaging with scientific evidence in their daily life and in their professional contexts. In her work, Eva Thorpe considers the specific challenges of research, representation across diverse knowledge domain, addressing topics that span from the health-related matters to the questions related to the teaching and reward. As a member of newly founded in the Institute of Planetary Health Behavior at the University of Erfurt, she has recently joined an interdisciplinary group of researchers seeking to gain better understanding of human behavior <laughs> in order to promote health and to protect the climate and the environment. She currently serves as an associate editor of the German Journal of Educational Psychology. Her research has been founded by the press of the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research. So I would like to warmly welcome our, our established keynotes, Eva and Saria. Please. Great. And we'd like to start by thanking the early to work committee for giving us this uh, 
uh, award, and we're very honored by it. And we would like to thank the conference organizers, joined by Ingans, and especially uh, early president, Lady Chief, <coughs> for her support. And in our talk today, we decided not just to tell you about our award paper, but also to give a broader overview of uh, research on how learners can make sense of disagreements about knowledge and how to support them in dealing with such disagreements. And we will argue that learning to cope with disagreements is not only important for making sense of our uncertain world, but it is also uh, an opportunity for promoting grasp of the social nature of knowledge, by which we need understanding of how knowledge develops through social processes of critical debate and consensus building. So our talk will have four parts. First of all, we'll, we will define what epistemic disagreements are and explain why they care about them to try to persuade you also why you should care about them. Then we will discuss how learners can cope with epistemic disagreements, and to do so, we will present the framework of productive lay engagement with disagreements and show some of its theoretical underpinnings and some of its supporting evidence. In the third part, we will talk a little bit about how to support productive engagement with disagreements and show some examples of ongoing research into scaffolds that we've been building and developing our to do that. And finally, we'll draw some conclusions and uh, assess future directions. So, what are epistemic disagreements and why should we care about them? So, it's probably no surprise to this audience that experts often disagree with each other. So just think about all those times you disagree with priority number two. But to give a more everyday example, let's say you want to refresh yourself on a hot conference day. Should you drink an artificially sweetened beverage? So uh, Coke Zero and Pepsi Max lovers might be concerned to hear that recently the WHO labeled the artificial sweetener aspartame as possibly parts of the jet. But not so fast, the FDA disagreed with the WHO and said that aspartame is safe. And these agencies disagreeing because they had different assessments with quality and available evidence. So, of course, Nestor's told always disagree with the Unfortunately, there is no disagreement about the reality of human caused climate change. However, scientists can disagree about how to mitigate climate change. So for example, some scientists argue that forestation is a highly effective mitigation strategy, and this has led to huge tree planting campaigns, like this campaign by a famous YouTuber, Mr. Beast, that was in 96 in the decline. Uh, however, other scientists say that forestation action has a much more limited potential because a forestation has created complex effects that offset the carbon capture of the Turning to history, historians have a long-running debate on the causes and drivers of the Cold War that arise from different interpretations and motives and events. And an example of a more recent historical debate is the debate on what really caused the U.S. to invade Iraq 20 years ago. If they actually think there were, but that's the structure there. And closer to home, as some of you may know, there's a disagreement among education researchers about whether inquiry-based learning is beneficial. So, for example, researchers disagree about the evaluation and interpretation of the available evidence and about, um, about outcomes of inquiry based learning. And they also disagree about which variables are going to take into account when I mean, you analyze the effects of inquiry based learning. So, people can have diverse types of disagreements. So, our focus in this talk is on epistemic disagreements, which are epistemic uh, disagreements that are related to knowledge and knowing such as disagreements about what is true, what is justified, and also about how to know. And we will mostly focus in this talk about reasonable disagreements about what is true, although the, our suggestions can also apply to other kinds of disagreements, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we're mostly interested in learners' encounters, which episodic disagreements between various kinds of experts in knowledge domains such as history and biology. And when we say experts, we mean people, who have a high degree of knowledge and also abilities to contribute to knowledge in some domain. And this did include researchers, but not only, it can also be professionals and experts within the community. Now, although disagreements can sometimes be frustrating, they are generally considered as now the world for advancing knowledge. And perhaps a key value is that social process of criticism and debate underlie the objectivity of science. 
And we use science in the, uh, here in the broad sense of that includes the natural sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. So disagreements can encourage researchers to explore alternative paths, to recognize and remedy argument flaws, to motivate the, and motivate evidence collection, although they find out what's going on, and they can help uh, motivate researchers to uh, back the conclusions through tough criticism. But as we know, this does not always happen. So Helen Longin has noted that you know to really read these notes, you need some kind of you need a community that has authority of perspectives, that has commitments to shared epistemic norms, and that really provides opportunities for discourse to conferences and various other jobs. <laughs> but from the perspective of the lay public, disagreements may not appear so beneficial. So the contentious nature of knowledge is highly visible in the media which often covers developing science. And uh, there's multiple studies that have found that exposure to conflicting claims and findings can be increased with certainty, uh, reduce trust in messages and sources, and can even lead to lower trust in science, which be general. So education could potentially help prepare students for engaging with epistemic disagreements. And however, we well know that learners usually have very few opportunities to do this and to grapple with disagreements in their studies because knowledge in school is most short presented as subtle and consensual. So we argue that education should attend more to disagreements in order to prepare learners for daily work flowing over everyday lives and future studies. Yet this is also a challenge for science communication, which could support lifelong learning about disagreements outside of state and versus the science communication for lectures. However, addressing epistemic disagreements is also a lot of work. It requires careful attention and deliberate effort. So kind of before we go into and, and deeper, we would like to say a bit more about why we think that we should educators, we science communicators, we care about this. So first, there's a practical argument. So the hope is that better understanding of disagreements might help people draw on the best available knowledge when they need to make decisions about issues that affect them, their communities, or their environments. And of course, science is not the only uh, source of knowledge to guide decisions, but it is an important thing to discover line of knowledge about the world. Uh, and getting to disagreements can also support intellectual development, so it can provide opportunities for developing individual and collective sense-making, reasoning, and argumentation abilities. It can foster understanding of complex issues, and it can also promote grasp of the social nature of knowledge, that is how knowledge can improve through processes of critical discourse and consensus development. And finally, controversy and disagreement are at the heart of democracy, or as Hess put it, democracy demands controversy. So engagement with disagreements can introduce the democratic ideal that diversity of views and opinions is both legitimate and valuable. And this tells the commitment to seeking and preferring positions that are supported by good reasons and evidence and um, these values are becoming increasingly important now because of the growing uh, trends of social polarization, populism, and attacks on democracy. <laughs> and so in many countries, including Israel, we are fighting to protect our democracies. And the fight for democracy has many fronts. And one of these fronts is the fight for democratic intellectual values, such as the value of diversity of perspectives and critical debate. And schools and higher education are some of the most on sites for cultivating the intellectual medallions that the state of democracy. At the same time, education and academia can only flourish in a democratic environment. Sadly. So we've explained why it is important to engage learners with disagreement. So let's have a look at how they can actually cope with the attitude of disagreements. And here, our concern is specifically with how learners can productively engage with controversies. We define this as engaging with disagreements in open minded and open minded and critical ways that uh, support individual and collective directed sense making. And by open minded and critical, we mean that they understand appreciate the value of disagreements and our intellectual diversity from knowledge communities and that they know how to make informed choices by evaluating the reliability of sources and information. 
To that understand when witches can learn to engage productively with disagreements, we propose the framework, a framework of productive engagement with disagreements. And I will give you now the short overview of the three main components of our sign work and the interrelations or the, inter um, the interrelations um, between those two components. We're at the top to mechanize to this framework. So the first component is understanding disagreements. It refers to the understanding of the legitimacy and the value of disagreements. And furthermore, it also entails um, the understanding of awareness about the reasons for why experts might disagree. Understanding of the disagreement informs how when you evaluate and interpret and disagreement. Productive innovation specifically entails the, uh, the coordination of first and second hand strategies and criteria by evaluating both sources and information. Yet, while we engaged with the disagreement and while evaluating a disagreement, learners may also in turn and inform their understanding about reasons and about illegitimacy. Of a so this is not the one way road. I still the understandings and the evaluation of controversy where this can resolve disagreement. That is, it can be decided on if, but decide on if and when to take a stance. Resolution can resolve or can resolve in various stances. This could be to, for example, either suspend the judgment or to adopt an affordable stance on a personal or collective meta. We will impact each of this component from this section, and I will start with the first, understanding disagreement. I will first only speak about learners understanding of the legitimacy and value of Disney words before I will report or give you an overview of research on the understanding of the reasons a lot of experts disagree. To so engage with disagreements, learners need to understand that there are legitimate reasons for why experts can um, reach either the conclusions. Starting, starting the grasp of the nature of legitimacy of disagreements has been a key focus of several models at this time thinking. And one set your model, as you can see, is the model developed at, um, of the Senate video at this kind of understanding by Diamond and, and Collins. And this model describes three main perspectives regarding the nature and the legitimacy of disagreements. So, learners endorse some abstractist views that they perceive discrepant accounts as facts that are either right or wrong. From this perspective, disagreements are not legitimate because only one account can be right. According to a multiple perspective, Descriptive accounts are considered as subjective families that can be either right or wrong, and equally right and wrong. From this perspective, disagreement is legitimate, but I fear talk because it's still may not possible to decide between opinions. And finally, the evaluated this perspective intricates both the objective and the subjective to meet the dimension of the knowing. From this perspective, Descriptive accounts are considered as judgments or interpretations, and disagreement is understood or perceived as the legitimate reflection of the interpreter's nature of knowledge, without first seeking the need to evaluate the competing claims based on roles and annotation per evidence. These perspectives are the least action that come into play as learners just evaluate and construct knowledge, and they are adept they adapted to the topic at stake, to the domain of context and the scope. If that, as people can perceive disagreements or the legitimacy of a disagreement differently across different situations. And this may apply to all pandemic controversies. This is important because here, an analogy of this perspective is a cruel period, as more than one tradition can be held legitimately. And this brings us um, directly to the question why epistemic perspectives match that. At first, multiple studies, especially evaluative perspectives, uh, are shown to support the engagement with disagreements. For example, evaluativism is associated with either better recognition, integration, and reconciliation of contrasting positions. This suggests that a predetermining the legitimacy of disagreements had an every child on certain diverse or alternative perspectives. 
Yes, engagement with the readers can also support that sometimes on the specific or certain conditions the adoption of evaluative perspectives. This is, is especially the case when readers have opportunities to meaningfully engage with diverse perspectives. The bit of break that is. Besides, or in addition to assumptions about the legitimacy of disobedience, it is also important that learners understand why the experts disagree. And, and learners have subject to assumptions about the underlying reasons for disagreement, and these subject to assumptions can help them to evaluate and reconcile a disagreement. Across various studies, we have examined and asked the learners how they had to explain uh, why they think experts might disagree. For example, we used the disagreement um, about the formation of frauds between two biologists. Then we asked learners to explain as why they think the biologists disagree. And the disagreements came up with various reasons. For example, this participant noted that they might focus on different uh, aspects or uh, factors, while well, focus on parasites and the other can kind of this participant knows that there might be differences in the perspective in the background of the biologists or the XA. It's possible that one of them is more biological and the other works in the field of chemistry. <laughs> Overall, it's a qualitative um, data such like this attendee study and also part two data, we identified four categories on disagreeing themes that learners refer to. So these are the subjective assumptions. So they explain disagreement between experts due to topic complexity. Researchers, for example, can focus on different aspects um, or consider the aspect of multiple factors. Not all factors can be considered at once. Learners also consider differences in what research method is used. So, for example, researchers can use measures, procedures, or refer to different data sources. Learners also consider the person of the research. So they explain this group also due to researchers' motivation. For example, researchers can be influenced by their financial, personal, or political interests um, in order to award or advocate a specific account. And finally, we also know the differences and researchers' back ties. Researchers, researchers can differ in their expertise, competences, and perspectives that affect their work. Interestingly, these four categories of reasons are emphasized differently across the different topics. So in the interview starting we represented as just depends um, the disagreement on frogs, this was an analogy coffee. We also asked them to additionally explain a disagreement about the history. In the biology topic, Assistants mentioned especially topic complexity and research methods as reasons for the disagreement. So they rather focus on the what was researched and how it was researched. In contrast, in the history topic, participants most often mention um, explanations of reasons and researchers' backgrounds. They also refer to the reasons of public opacity and research methods. But in contrast to the biology uh, controversy, you can see here that they focus rather on who did the research. <laughs> At that point, I have to note that um, our participants usually came up with just one or two reasons when they were when interviewed them. So they did not use the full range of reasons or diverse reasons. However, being aware of the diverse views for the subpoena is important to understand the legitimacy of disagreement and can also help them to um, evaluate a disagreement. For example, um, for example, understanding a disagreement or understanding that the disagreement stems from topic of exity and the diversity of networks may support learners in the stem of its legitimacy. It might also help to counter um, a loss in trust in experts, though they can't. Yet, engage of the disagreement may also help learners to further their understanding of such reasons. So, disagreement reasons may also develop through engaging with controversies. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about how learners understand disagreements, and now I'll go a bit deeper into how they might evaluate these disagreements. 
So underlying our analyses is Phil Itcher's notion of the division of cognitive labor. So this is the idea that knowledge is not evenly distributed in society and that people have different areas in knowledge and expertise. And this means that we are all epistemically dependent on our own to do almost anything. The initial implication of the division of cognitive labor is that we have to take into account that others usually have the bounded understanding of the topics that are debated by an accident. Because we usually have limited conceptual and methodological knowledge about these topics. Of course, experts too have valid understanding of topics that lie beyond your own specific specializations. And the critical question that you know, we wrestle with is how can lay persons evaluate epistemic sweetness despite with limitations? So, Stauber and Brummett proposed to actually completely engage with conflicting information sources scientific information, and laypersons first need to uh, detect and recognize that a conflict even exists. Okay, this is not a trivial step because they can ignore the conflict or just explain it away. It is a conflict to recognize and they can take two types of evaluation approaches to resolve it. First hand evaluation involves examining the validity and plausibility of information. This can be a quick and efficient approach but it requires an adequate level of accurate prior knowledge in order to be successful. And when prior knowledge is low, a more reliable approach may be to engage in what we've called sending down evaluation. That is to examine the who are the sources that are providing the information and whether they are trustworthy. And knowing who it trusts can help people judge which claims are more likely to be true or to be merited. And one of our aim, one of the aims of our um, um, outstanding publication award paper was to gain a better understanding of how learners might actually go about managing this first and hand and second hand evaluation, how they might coordinate uh, first hand and second hand evaluation as they address conflicting expert accounts. Um, and to do this, he wanted to take a closer look at their actual evaluation st strategies. And we conducted the study which attempted master's student to national ADOs where they simply give contribution to the study and to our thing. So in the study, we proposed a model that we called the bi-directional model of first and second half evaluation. This model schemes that students may use several categories of first-hand strategies to examine the validity of the information. If learners know something about the topic, they can evaluate the validity of information based on what they know and believe, as Grifter and colleagues have demonstrated. That is, um, it, there is an also use uh, what we've called discourse-based evaluation. This is actually a category of strategies uh, that focuses on examining various features of a discourse of how information is communicated and justified and using these features to infer the validity and uh, quality of information. So for example, since the fan that learners examine the writing to see if it reflects scientific norms, if the arguments are consistent, supported by relevant reasons and evidence, so they can rely on how the information looks and how it's presented. And learners can also corroborate the accounts. That is, they can compare them to each other and identify areas of agreement and disagreement, and they can also examine if other experts uh, agree with these claims, and if there is a majority or consensus view that might support one of their positions. Finally, students might also use second-hand sourcing strategies to examine if the sources are that are providing the information and trustworthy, by which we mean if they are have adequate expertise and other contentions and are acting in integrity. So for example, they may have laterally that is when they search online for information about the source, but sometimes that information is not available, so they then use other strategies such as relying on other people's recommendations and more. So in this sense, you're arguing that trust in sources, including scientific ones, should be informed trust and based on critical evaluation. This is not an exhaustive list of all possible strategies, but we think it captures some of the main categories of strategies that Margaret used. And we see learners use these strategies and in multiple contexts, if we're being referred to videos and various media. And our first assumption is that learners can have a repertoire of strategies and can dialectically coordinate multiple first and second hand strategies as they evaluate them to the account. So we call the lie just one strategy. So learners' first hand evaluation strategies are the basis for forming judgments of information validity or quality. 
And these drug elements can in turn impact source, very drug means source of the On the other hand, learners can also evaluate source features, and this can inform their judgments of source of organisms and ensure their judgments of information related to their quality. So our second assumption is that there are reciprocal work relations between information and source judgments, and that the outcomes of evaluation depend on how learners coordinate these strategies and the way these cues. Our third assumption is that the strand cue selection is shaped by internal resources, such as students' prior knowledge and skills, uh, metacognition, academic understanding, motivation, as well as by external uh, resources, such as the kinds of information and search tools they can use, available time, and more. So to test this model and its assumptions, we examine how learners score first and second hand evaluation as we evaluate unfamiliar versus familiar controversies. And we did this in order to examine the rule of prior knowledge and beliefs and how others might uh, manage this uh, evaluation under different levels of prior knowledge. So we use a famous disagreement scenario, the Living War scenario, that was developed in the 1980s by Kian Achud and the colleagues. And this scenario tells about a war between, um, on the wars actually, between two fictional cow countries, North and South Libya. And students are presented with two expert accounts on um, the fifth Libyan war, which present in discrepant narratives about the causes, events, and outcomes of the war. And this scenario never is amazed in both of the studies. So we capitalize on the fact that students actually based the Libyan war scenario on an authentic historic controversy about a reward. And this is a controversy regarding the causes and outcomes of the confrontation between Israel and Egypt that was part of the Yom Kippur War that occurred in 1973. Israeli students are familiar with the Yom Kippur War from their high school studies and families and media discussion. And the popular perception in Israel is that although Israel had severe losses in the war, it eventually had with her hand in the coffin. And this view is consistent with the account of the wanted destroyers and both of it, so they out with the other one. So we took a Libyan war scenario and we created an unveiled version in which we replaced the fictional names as ends and dates with the actual ones. And um, this enabled us to kind of nicely manipulate topic familiarity while keeping source credentials and marking it on a continent and we got various controls so we know that they don't write kind of the Libyan war scenario. Really works very well. And we conducted two studies in which we randomly assigned students to reading either the Libyan War scenario or the Ultra Poor scenario and examined how they evaluate the discreteness. And the results of those two studies were mostly similar, so I will show you some of the results of the first study, uh, which involved 104 Israeli university students. We asked the students to judge the students' claims and to explain their judgments. When the controversy was unfamiliar, Students who always live in mind on first-hand evaluation of the discourse. That is, they evaluate the quality of their argumentation and communication. For example, if the claims are well-supported and logical, they also rely on not soften and other first-hand strategies of knowledge-based validation, being comprehend all the wars, and corroboration. And some students, Melba Lock, also use sourcing strategies to evaluate the claims. Now, in contrast, when the controversy was familiar, prior knowledge kicked in, and what you could see is what dropped was the discourse-based evaluation. They did not do that a lot. And they strongly um, relied on their knowledge-based uh, validation to down downright planes. So they said things like, I remember that the trend changed during the war. And they also engaged in global corroboration and some sourcing. Now, let's take a look at the strategies students use to evaluate the sources, okay? So they looked at claims. This is how they evaluate the sources, the historians. So when they were asked to evaluate the historians' performance, about half used sourcing strategies. But it's not obvious and effective what the sourcing strategies are, even when you ask them to evaluate sources. So they looked at the historians' credentials and motivations, and for example, one student wrote, it's for a job to study the Israeli Arab wars. We know what they're talking about in their X-based slides. However, the students also used first-hand evaluation strategies. Uh, some discourse-based evaluation, a knowledge-based validation, or to out into sources. So we also looked at the information and used that to trust source features. And all of this was reflected in their judgments of the claims. So, 
and the uh, from the other topic, planes were judged uh, as they had really similar to both flights. In the unfamiliar controversy, in the familiar controversy, sorry, uh, Stinson really bore with the claim of the historians, the story that was consistent for prior knowledge, and it really was with claims of the historian that conflicted with prior knowledge as can be expected. What's a bit more interesting is when they judge Chotko's work in this, again, in the unfamiliar controversy and the interferences. And in the familiar controversy, we see the impact of knowledge based validation on source of this So if they judge this story, then it's a yellow meat of war in the, um, as a warrior sort as well. So to summarize, learners can use coordinate and use multiple evaluation strategies. Uh, when topic standardity is low and paradigm is low, they mainly rely on discourse depth and evidence based evaluation along with global motion sourcing. When they have prior knowledge, um, knowledge based validation is dominant, but they also use so source of strategies. So we've seen in this study and in many other studies that students will, despite their bounded understanding, rely on their prior knowledge as we found with expert accounts and expert disagreements. And so what, kind of, what was our approach? How do we address this situation? So we consider prior knowledge as kind of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can help students understand and evaluate information, and it can also protect against unevaluated information and sources. On the other hand, it can also bias and lead to court-mindedness. So we think it is unrealist and also undesirable to the speculators to set aside what they know. However, learners can use, learn to use uh, additional strategies such as sourcing corroboration that and you know, use them in parallel to an all stack based validation. And also, they might be supporting developing their awareness of the strengths of limitations of experts' knowledge as well as their own knowledge so that they have a better sense of when they can rely on their own judgments and when to defer to experts. So we've looked a bit about, at how um, students can understand and value disagreements. Now let's see how they can resolve them. Let's start by taking a look at how the students in our study resolve the disagreements. So some students just spend it for a job. So they rated the claims similarly around this hill and the dim range in direction. And these participants often mentioned for lack of knowledge with a reason versus finding judgment. And some students disagree with both historians, though for right, because they perceive the content between them as detracting from their reliability. Some students, however, said accepted both with claims of both historians because they saw merit in their accounts or they accepted that there could be multiple perspectives, like the student said it's a matter of perspective. And some students agreed more a little I mean, we spoke that a little bit more on historians. This was really a minority position. Very few students did that. Wow. But the most frequent stance was to agree with one historian and disagree with each other. So we staff that we choose one. And it's interesting because students did not really have a very strong basis for judgments, but they nonetheless had a tendency to yield pick a side. So can learners make reasonable choices between assenting experts? So the philosopher Alvin Goldman argues that all of this could be really hard for them to do. They often have no choice. They need to make decisions, and they need to decide who to follow as um, they need to make decisions that can impact their lives, their families, their communities. And Goldman recommends that um, laypersons can make very imperfect, but still justified choices by giving three things the parallel three of the strategies that we and others have also identified. That is, they can examine expertise and vested interests, they can examine the degree of agreement by other experts, and they can examine our documentation poll. So, kind to map up this section, to resolve expert disagreements, there's still some things that learners can do. They can kind of understand if this is a legitimate disagreement and why the experts disagree. They can evaluate the disagreement using strategies uh, such as sourcing, corroboration, and discourse based evaluation. And based on their understandings of evaluations, they need to ask themselves three critical questions Are both positions well supported? Is one position better supported than the other? And what are the stakes? Do I need to make a decision? Where are the stakes of being wrong? Where are the stakes of ignoring one of the experts? 
And depending on their answers, they can decide if they want to suspend judgment or take a stance, you know, choosing one of the sides or maybe meaning to quite the sides and being mindful of the uncertainty that is involved. Okay, so we well unpicked all three main components of our framework. Now let's have a look how we can use the framework in order to support productive engagement. This framework can inform the design and analysis of schedules that can help or that can help the learners to foster their capabilities. Researchers of various disciplines have developed scaffolds that address some of those competencies. For example, scaffolds for understanding evaluate and understanding disagreements can help learners to recognize areas of agreement and disagreement and to understand the underlying causes and reasons for widespread disagree. Scaffolds for evaluating disagreements can support learners' strategies or enough evaluation strategies relevant um, or such as relevant for argument evaluation, source evaluation, and collaboration. And scaffolds for resolving disagreements can help learners to weigh arguments and explanations in order to draw conclusions. With our research, we tied in, in these efforts, and today we will present on two strands of research in which we developed scaffolds. And I will start to present on studies of which we sort of are um, and to promote learners' understanding of disagreement reasons in particular. And in this strand of research, we examined whether reading and explanations about disagreement reasons has support learners' understanding and innovation of controversies. As mentioned earlier, learners are aware of various reasons, but they often manage just one or two. So, and then a line on a narrow range of reasons got us on a very narrow view of a conflict. For example, they might attribute um, uh, a disagreement to poor motivations, and then the topic of complexity and the diversity of research methods, though these might be important still. So we wondered whether providing an instructional explanation about disagreement reasons may help learners consider more, more reasons and more diverse reasons. So in the second study of our 2022 paper, the award paper, and the second study um, uh, not after the studies I've just presented, and we provided it all the participants an explanation of disagreement reasons before they like either the unsingular version or the familiar version of the history disagreement. The sample was again at a sample of Israeli University students. And the explanation presented to them and explained very briefly to them three very important categories of reasons that are relevant to understand his um, controversies in history. And that were the role topic complexity, the role of differences in research methods, as well as um, differences in the perspectives and evidence of the historians. And the results showed, actually, that video explanation and no effects on plan judgment, source truthfulness, and evaluation strategies. However, it had a positive effect on evaluative perspectives. So here, highlighted in blue, Participants having read an explanation shows a stronger endorsement of evaluativist perspectives. This indicates a greater acceptance of the legitimacy of the disobeyer. Interestingly, this effect, um, or there was no interaction effect with top of verity, so this perceived legitimacy might uh, seem to increase even when learners might agree with one, uh, one position more than the other. However, it remained unclear to us why the Werner effects in evaluation. And we wondered whether this might relate to uh, participants' strong reliance on first hand evaluation, but also the best use might have read and not actively applied the reasons we presented to them. So we wondered whether we could strengthen and push the effect of learning about disagreement reasons. And a new recent study we followed, followed up on these considerations. And we um, specifically examined whether self explaining reasons for disagreement can support learners' understanding and innovation of controversy. Self explanation 
can encourage learners to generate inferences and integrate information. Studies show that it can be beneficial um, to comprehending logical presentations and documents. And in our introduced studies, we've seen that learners cannot solve this form of disobedience. However, since they came up only with a few ones, they might need support. But so, learners might need support in considering a wide range of reasons. And possibly, self explanatory and disobedient might be more productive after having read um, the explanation about legitimate cases before. So, in this follow up study, we examined whether a self explaining disagreements and reading and, ex and structured explanation of our reasons can support various understanding and evaluation of controversy, and whether they do so separately or combined. To this end, we asked that his colleagues to write the self explanation of the reasons for disagreement after having read a history of similar. So this study followed a two by two design uh, with independent factors, reading and explanation about reasons, and writing a set explanation about the sleep causes. And we ran this study twice. In the first study, we used the unfamiliar version of the history controversy, the leading of war version. In the second study, that we write afterwards, we use the family version of the topic. So here we use uh, the LD poor or scenario. And those studies we conducted with um, Israeli university students or graduates. So they had, uh, uh, some of them had an um, academic degree. And they were also in the second study, Alanya, with the topic. In the following, I will present on the results of both studies jointly and point to differences whenever it is needed. Again, regarding the judgments of uh, the claims, there were no effect on reading explanation or self-explaining um, the disagreement reasons or the interaction. However, there was a, or there were effects of um, both, or there were effects of the um, factors on judgments of first, for stress reasons. Reading explanation increased actually trust and backsplits but it did so differently across both studies. So at our just consideration the unfamiliar topic, we could observe the abilities and trust for both experts. In the familiar topic, we could observe this only for the belief consistent expert. So it seems possible that um, in the familiar topic, the intervention line had not been strong enough to overcome the applicant's prior beliefs. Self-explanation and yes, our expectations had no ring effect. Actually, in the unfamiliar topic, it inhibited the positive um, effect of reading our explanation when combined both um, drums with each other. In addition, we wanted to also learn a bit more about how learners actually perceive the value of disagreement from knowledge production. So in this study, we also asked them to assess enough of controversies between historians they got regarding the leading war or the non cool war can lead to better knowledge and understanding of the war and help to reach more accurate research results. And here again, we found a positive effect of reading explanation. It increased perceived value in both topics. topics. And you see it here, this is the data and the chart of the first study where we used the unfeminine topic and uh, plan out at blue, you can see the mean values of the groups uh, who read an explanation. And the C value, or endorsement of the C value, was especially higher when there was no self explanation um, combined with it. The results regarding self explanation were less consistent in critical studies. In the end, from topic, it decreased actually the perceived value. This was again, again, scored. Um, original assumptions. And in the standard topics, there that are no effect of perceived value. In consistency to our um, 2020 published study, we also measured criticism's endorsement of evaluative perspectives as an indicator for the acceptance of the legitimacy of the disagreement. However, we could not recover this effect in this study, though I had to mention that 
uh, in relativist perspectives, correlated positively with the perceived value of disagreement and knowledge and actual attention. So, to conclude, what do we know so far from this trend of research on supporting various understanding of the disagreement mechanisms? We found initial evidence that real an explanation about um, reasons for disagreement and increase the perceived legitimacy and value of controversies. And also, it can increase trust and in competing exhibits. So understanding reasons can help govern us to appreciate and evaluate the controversy. On the contrary, self-explanational or self-explaining reasons can no or mitigating effects on perceived value of disagreement. And what explanation actually can be that learners' self-explanations might have foreground researchers' background and uh, with relation to the possible cause, leading them to foreground rather explanations of researchers' subjectivity and bites, which might have reduced um, the perceived value um, of the disagreement. Um, we could, or, to, to some point, you can at least see this from the inspection of the self or the reasons they came up with when they self-explained the disagreement. So coming with child of time work, these results show that learners require support to understand reasons. Therefore, it is important to develop skills such as we have presented today, but also as developed by Nochizuki and colleagues. And to support the understanding of reasons can also help learners to evaluate a controversy. Supporting evaluating disagreements. And I'm also going to move from the lab into the country, so I'm going to switch a bit. Uh, and the middle school classroom, so this is work that we're going to I'm doing in uh, middle school classroom to students. And when we think about working in classrooms with teachers and designing disagreements in schools, there's a kind of dueling challenge, or this core dual challenge, which is that you know, teachers and admirers need to draft the book. So the first challenge is how to open up the space to introduce small for explanations or arguments. And this raises many dilemmas about how to uh, introduce or facilitate um, multiple accounts, which kinds of disagreements to bring into a cloud streaming, how to encourage engagement with these disagreements. And the second challenge is how to cultivate critical evaluation practices. That is, critical evaluation aims criteria and strategies as students engage with these disagreements. And this raises also many questions about like, which uh, are children's strategy and want to focus on, how do we support these, how do we get students to engage with them in ways that sustain their agency skills, agency and motivation. So uh, uh, what I'm going to show now is to work for people until they on two strategies that are related to earlier. And these are strategies of sourcing and corroboration. And as we've shown you, these are strategies that are reliable strategies that students can use, but we also know that they infrequently use one. And this has led to a lot of recent efforts uh, to develop interventions uh, for fostering sourcing and collaboration skills. And there's and many people here with the working on these interventions. Um, I mean, I could not second hold, sorry. Um, but uh, some of the more, you know, effective practices from brief studies are contrasting cases, modeling, explaining, crunching, and more. So there's lots of things that you can do out. So we've been interested in why we could examine if mapping could be used to support sourcing and corroboration. So mapping is a generative learning activity. We can support cognitive processes of selection, organization, and integration. But for me, what's more interesting is what Novik and Dovin Penn has already said about maps in the 1980s, is that mapping actually supports learners uh, in a cognitive understanding of the nature of knowledge, how knowledge is constructed by creating language speaking concepts, and they can also experience these processes. So we have proposed that in a digital age, knowledge now shows from sources to support understanding that knowledge is socially constructed by multiple sources and like various people coming from different areas and different perspectives. So we designed a mapping scaffold that includes a representation of sources of knowledge. And the idea of the scaffold is that it enables students and teachers to represent in class and then talk about this, 
the, they could represent this notion that there can be more than one answer, more than one explanation or argument. And also the knowledge construction and evaluation require just steering source to curiousness, looking who's the source, and also identifying patterns, movement and disagreement among sources. So we built a digital learning environment that is called the Knowledge Society Sandbox. It's available in Hebrew and in the Alamo. And we, this is a product of a research practice partnership with the Center for Educational Technology, which is an organization that was just in Israel. So students either get or create a set of information sources or documents, and they can evaluate virtual sorgatists and extract ideas or claims or explanations or evidence from these uh, applicants. And then they can create maps that represent the network of connections between sources and contents. And they also have a writing area in which we can write using the documents and the now. So in our classroom interventions, teachers first model how to them the sources and how to uh, map the multiple documents, and they start creating very self controversy just two documents, and gradually um, proceed to more complex ones. Uh, students then engage in mapping and diets of teacher guidance and feedback. And then students share their work with their classmates who should be screen it. And they can discuss it and reflect on it. And in these discussions, teachers invite students to explain which of the cool functions we come from their maps and how it leads to these conclusions. How do we know that? My side very key conclusion. And this provides opportunities for discussing both the content through the evidence as well as articulating the um, evaluation criteria and processes. So we conducted a quasi, one quasi-experimental classroom uh, study in which we engaged ninth grade students in eight, eight hours on learning about historical controversies and document acts. And very briefly, in our analyses of students' work and discourse, we found that hearing from that supported engagement um, uh, in, in an in evaluation and integration of multiple documents, and also the discourse between students about how they evaluate and integrate. And this supported metacognitive understanding with knowledge on um, evaluation and integration, so they were actually talking metacognitively about what they were doing and how they were evaluating and comparing the documents. And the outcomes uh, in the process were growth in evaluation and integration of resilient documents and transfer tests. So if this study was published, I'm not going to talk a lot about it. I will talk a little bit more about a more recent study that we did. This is also a Moise experimental study with ninth break students, but this time in the biology domain, and wanted to see uh, to what extent this tool can support uh, evaluation and evaluation of the biology with the kind biology documents. So uh, Dana tells if you're not the study, and she presented the results on Wednesday, so I will just share some highlights from the study. So we had three candidates of the study. He had a business material we told. He had a book that evasion mapping various controversies. And we had a map of plus metacognitive discussions about criteria reviews. So these are students that also discuss criteria for evaluating the documents and document maps. And we used evolutional controversies to be adapted from the Praxis project developed by Harish and Lee Goran and Arnold Reinhardt. And um, yeah, so here's an example of one of the controversies that students worked on. So the Dryden question here was what caused the change in the head size of the red-bellied blacksmith? And students encountered two competing explanations. One was that they were snake hunters and collectors that were catching these snakes and this was somehow affecting the head size. The other explanation that there were squeezes cane toads that were affecting the head size of the snakes. And they got some documents which got we presented various arguments and evidence and the <sighs> relation from the website of Say Catch and Company to an adaptive scientific journal on it. So here we can see, oh, and that's created by one of the dyes in the study. So one of the students who worked on this now, Ben, uh, evaluated the document by the Snake Catching Company as having a low plus worthiness. This is a document that's too red, you see this red? And his partner, Amit, didn't exactly understand why Ben thought this document had built for swerviness and asked him, why is it built? And Ben explained, I don't know, because it's not exactly. I meet experts about this topic, and they are advertising themselves. So he noted expertise and commercial interests. 
In the next session, and then they finished her nap, and then they discussed uh, a fund for what caused a change and the evidence for illustrative explanations, and they were initially unsure uh, which of the explanations was the more accurate. Then he said, there's all grounding. It's a word that we have in Hebrew. It means justification. It's not exactly justifications. This, uh, for the toads. Uh, and Ben agreed with him, and then he added that the toads like the snake war, <coughs> and they talked about this more, and after some discussion, and they suggested, but the conclusion is that the toads cape caused the heads to become smaller because it untrustworthy says, say that it's because hunters hunt them, and all of the trustworthy sources say that it's toads. So this kind of shows how the forens of the map may encourage Jews to know the source trustworthiness and to corroborate accounts as they had um, made it. So our main measure for assessing the outcomes of these interventions is that since students write arguments based on both reflecting other documents uh, with diverse trustworthiness on transfer topics, can also ask them to validate these outcomes. And some of the key results from this study is that students in both mapping groups use more source evaluation criteria and also employed significantly more critical source evaluation to justify their conclusions and their essays. So like one student wrote, I only referred first to the information sources. We presented studies to sufficiently reliable sources of our conflict of interest and show that these are people who understand the subject. Yet we also saw that supplementing the maps with class discussions of the evaluation criteria led to greater growth in the cognitive knowledge about evaluation criteria and more critical functional ratings. So mapping and support graphs of how to evaluate conflicting information sources and draw conclusions from them. But of course, this is not the only possible way of doing this, and other people in the working group are developing other approaches uh, for addressing this challenge. So we now turn to our conclusions and possible future directions. At the beginning of our talk, we made clear that it's important that we need to care about epistemic disagreements. Learners will encounter conflicting knowledge and they need competencies to face conflicts and disagreements. This is important so that they can make better decisions about issues that affect them and their communities, and so that they can reason about complex issues that understand how knowledge evolves or develops through social processes. We therefore consider the engagement of disagreements as right of a participation in democratic knowledge societies. And let us can reason that out at this time this means. And taking our framework, we show that various have capabilities to understand disagreements, to evaluate and resolve that that new results done. Yet, they require and benefit from support. Nevertheless, we can build on these understandings and skills to refine and strengthen them. And we can. We can support practical engagement. And we showcase this by presenting two strands of our research. First, we showed that supporting the understanding of the reasons for disagreements can foster awareness and understanding of the legitimacy and value of controversies, as well as the evaluation of them. And second, we showed that supporting critical evaluation source trustworthy tenants and degree IQ literacy can improve learners' skill and help them to draw well in front of films. So, let us hope that education can help learners to make better sense of the uncertain world. Learning to engage productively with epistemic disagreements can help us to navigate uncertain times in which societies may not face all wrong at most of the crisis at once. However, there is more, and of course there is always more that needs to be done and needs to be addressed. And we would like to point out some of the aspects called these um, potential current and future directions. So engaging with epistemic disagreements can get personal and emotional especially when one's own stakes are harder. So we need to consider how identities and emotions can shape the reasoning about epistemic disagreements. In that gene out there, yesterday, a Sinatra already made very clear of the qualities and certain emotions and identities, and we can only underline this aspect and the importance of it. 
for me, is the unnamed version of the disagreement with the history of the disagreement. So the Yale Kippur version of the disagreement right away. Uh, we saw that the disciplines indicated a uh, indicated, um, higher self relevance of the topic to them. So this could have contributed um, that they were a lot more engaged and a lot more motivated to engage with this disagreement. And identities and emotions can motivate and move for engagement, but they can also bias judgment. So both can act as facilitators and barriers of productive engagement. However, at MedSec, we also need to address the elephant in the room. What about this information? What about fake controversies? And of course, we need to address these challenges that come along with epistemic or reasoning about epistemic disagreements that post truth world, such as misinformation, deep epistemic disagreements, and also fake controversy. We believe that the framework can help us to do so. And I want to exemplify this by a short little brief next time how it can be used to address fake controversies. Fake controversies are fabricated despite the broad consensus in the scientific communities and among experts. And, and uh, the premise is to deny conclusions or to evaluate conclusions that conflict with economic or ideological agendas. And a goal is to simply keep the controversy alive, like Oreskes and Conway put it. To address fake controversies, or to identify tech controversies, it is of broken the awareness to understand what makes a controversy a legitimate one and when not. This understanding can um, help them to understand what a controversies are and why they are fabricated. And they need to learn, um, they need to learn um, uh, evaluating the post trust with is in the, the degree of consensus so that they can identify when a controversy is authentic and when it is not. You already, uh, already outlined and stressed our corporate sourcing and cooperation and our strategies. And when they identified that one position might actually not be supported by um, the consensus of the libel and curtain and experts, they can learn to critically ignore a controversies and, and go I can if we So these were two important points that we have to consider when we look on how we uh, reason about disagreements. But we also have to think about the channels to which we can support productive engagement. Ill. We've mentioned before that schools might offer only few opportunities for learners to battle with disagreements. To change this, we need to also foster teachers' competence for addressing epistemic disagreements. Engaging learners with controversial accounts can be challenging for teachers too, because it can sometimes even conflict with their own assumption about the certainty of knowledge. Teachers may be insecure about how to introduce controversies meaningfully, uh, though they may um, motivate the engagement from their students. Therefore, they may, to, they may need to expand their own abilities to deal with the controversies. Furthermore, teachers may need support in designing productive engagement within their classrooms. So they might need support in how to um, create and design learning environments and material materials to foster productive engagement. Yet, um, here I have to, to add that studies in the field of history and civics education and also in reasoning about social issues and also about argumentation um, already address both issues. So it is important to continue and extend this work. And finally, product or supporting productive engagement um, this evening is a joint task of both education and also science community. So we need to also consider or examine how controversies can be inductively communicated in the media and by experts themselves, so that the value and function of controversies and knowledge gradually can be acknowledged and valued or appreciated. Um, I'm coming to our last point. Um, we pointed out that several um, places that science is a social collaborative endeavor. So this is also the reason why we are here. So, um, 
And so there's also the development of the stroke and also of our projects. So we also like to take the opportunity where to very much um, and very much like to thank those who supported us in our work. And uh, wonderful Okay, so um, first of all, a big thanks to all the students and research assistants who work on this project. Uh, and Thais Abed, she did all the the Ashley Eagles, Dan Gasoville here, and Wilson and Zola, and we put on these snacks from the very stretch. And of course, we also want to thank um, our collaborators, um, Hannes Bauer, Rainer Kommer, Klaxchen, Joram Richard, Al Kanai. I did go on dark and be no head out, Michael Weinstock and I'm not so forth. We found out. Oh, and added thanks to the many colleagues who will read all of our names. So a lot of colleagues, uh, we have very, very fortunate to collaborate and I'm very wonderful to hold. And um, um, they spread us at work all the time and we some hearing this talk. Uh, and we're very happy and great. And the last co-host, I'm Sue Israel, signs that attention. In the Sundays. Well, thanks for seeing me.